All right. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And yeah, so we appreciate this opportunity to present some ideas to you. The way we're going to um, organize the presentation, of course, Martin and I do quite a bit of research together. Uh, I think we're both going to talk a little bit more detail about some of the things that we've done separately. And then Martin will uh, cover um, sort of the second half of the talk. So advances in last mile logistics is the title. And here's a rough outline. Um, we're going to talk about what's motivating this research. And it's primarily the first bullet point there, growth in e-commerce. Um, I'll introduce you some basics in last mile um, logistics organization and optimization. And then we'll talk about a number of innovations, some in more depth uh, than others. Okay, So that's the agenda. So let's start with e-commerce growth. So something is changing, has changed. The world has changed significantly, let's say. And that change has largely been driven by the growth in e-commerce. So there's plenty of statistics that you can look at that support this type of growth. Here we look at global measures of total e-commerce sales in billions of dollars um, over the starting in 2013 and then projected forward into 2018. The rate of change is slowing, but you can still see high levels of growth. Uh, projected 16, 15% growth year over year. Um, if you look at one of the biggest um, purveyors of e-commerce, Amazon, uh, look at their growth in merchandise sales in spanning from 2010 to 2015 here. Um, you can see, again, this high level of growth, almost approaching exponential growth. Um, and it's harder to read on this slide, but uh, what it's important to, to look here. This red line is showing you the, um, well, sorry, the blue here is showing you the net shipping costs uh, in order to support these levels of sales. And shipping costs are an extremely important part of allowing e-commerce to happen effectively. So what we're going to look at primarily today are ways to manage systems that are driven by e-commerce, and, and that's sort of what we're calling modern last mile logistics systems, and trying to manage the costs of delivering certain levels of service. One, of, one particular innovation that is you know, people want goods faster and faster. So there's this notion of same day delivery. It means different things to different people. I'll try to define it a little bit in a second. Uh, same day delivery is also forecasted to grow sort of at least exponentially for a while, maybe eventually with this S-curve type shape. Okay? So people are demanding products uh, in a different way, and they're demanding them faster than ever. Okay? So here's sort of the way I look at the fundamental change that's occurred in commerce. right? And you can see this picture here. Pictures like this are fairly common. What is it? It's a shopping mall that has the roof caved in and snow on the escalators. right? So the idea here is that there's a diminishing role in retail for retail stores. So stores are basically local inventory points where shoppers go in look at goods, make a purchase out of uh, a local inventory stock. This type of commerce is diminishing, and it's being substituted by commerce that provides product delivered directly to consumers. Okay, so it started with catalog, phone sales uh, a long time ago. You know, this isn't something new. But it's really become more explosive with mobile, um, uh, mobile internet connected devices. Um, one thing to think about is that the definition of what a consumer is purchasing, the product that they're purchasing, is also something you should think about. It's not just the physical item anymore, but it's also the level of service that comes with that item, right? So you're purchasing uh, a widget, but you're also purchasing that you will get it in two hours, or that you will get it in one week. So that service element is embedded in some sense in products, and the same physical product might be provided by different providers with different service levels, and those are sort of different products from that perspective. When can I get it matters, right? And all of this growth here has led to enormous changes in last mile logistics and the increased complexity of these systems. So let's talk a little bit about the basics. Um, the focus in this seminar, because of this growth in uh, direct-to-consumer commerce is going to be on this direct-to-consumer type of logistics, so making deliveries to individuals, not necessarily making last-mile deliveries to other types of facilities, retail stores, uh, distribution centers, et cetera. So why is the modern form of last-mile logistics so challenging? Well, consumers typically design, they, they demand product sizes that are much smaller. So shipment sizes are much smaller. 
Uh, the order sizes are smaller. And if you think about if you compare how much an individual is going to be receiving in a shipment versus how much you might be delivering to a retail store, hopefully you can obviously see a difference. Unless you like in my family where we get a large shipment almost every day of, of e-commerce goods. Um, many constantly changing geographically dispersed locations, of course. So individuals are in their homes, their workplaces. You'll see later we might be delivering to their cars or we might be somehow trying to deliver to them wherever they might be at any individual point in time. Obviously, individuals can be in a lot more geographic locations than the limited number of stores or distribution centers, et cetera, that were in traditional last mile distribution. And we're going to look in this basic section at understanding how these systems perform, primarily looking at cost per delivery. So, I'm not going to talk a lot about service levels here. We're going to assume that sort of a service level is, and I mentioned this earlier, the service level is sort of part of the product. So the product includes a service level. This is a product that I want in four hours. That's the product. Now, given that that's what the consumer wants, how are we going to organize a system to do that effectively? And we're going to focus primarily, therefore, on cost, if that makes sense. OK, so what's one of the primary drivers of uh, last mile delivery costs? Uh, one thing to think about is that since these order shipments are small, we're consolidating them into uh, shipments carried, at least presently, multiple shipments carried by single vehicles. That may change as we move more towards smaller automated vehicles. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But right now, um, typically consolidation is important, and we'll talk about why. So here you can see outbound uh, delivery tours from a distribution center making multiple deliveries to multiple delivery locations. And the one on the upper left is making a smaller number of deliveries. And the one on the lower right is making a larger number of deliveries. And hopefully you can see that the density of customers and the number of deliveries made um, allows you to decrease the cost per delivery in the lower right. right? So I'm somehow spreading cost um, over more customers in this in this part of the slide than in here, right? And you can also see that roughly, perhaps if you think about the travel distance of these two vehicles, they're not that different for these two sequences. And we're spreading that travel distance over more customers. Uh, and there may also be fixed costs. So let's talk about some of these uh, cost components more specifically now. So if you look at last mile costs, they tend to be focused in fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are basically related to how well we're using the vehicle. If we're using the vehicle at a high level of utilization, then that means that we're using fewer vehicles, fewer dispatches, let's say, uh, fewer vehicles per day. And that helps us reduce costs. But this sort of a fixed cost per vehicle. Similarly with drivers. So drivers are an expensive part of uh, last mile logistics. They tend to be paid per day or per, uh, per hour. Um, and these costs are also, in some sense, fixed. So if you can get more deliveries per driver hour, then you're going to be doing a better job with cost. And then variable costs, um, usually more focused on vehicle costs, although sometimes driver costs are variable with distance traveled. And oftentimes, distance traveled is the primary determinant here. So if we want to have an efficient system, what we like are short, short routes that don't use a lot of travel distance, if, if possible. Uh, that have high levels of capacity utilization so that we're spreading the fixed cost over as many deliveries as possible. So that's a basic. Um, the other thing you should think about, though, is that this idea that density is going to drive costs down is somewhat conflicting a little bit with service levels. Okay? So in traditional, uh, even traditional e-commerce, let's say, uh, you would have, let's place an order and we'll receive it in five to seven business days. Or more recently, let's place an order and it will be delivered in two-day service or three-day service or next-day service. Okay. The growth now is more in this type of area, same-day service or very short window. I order now and it's delivered in two hours. Okay. Now, what the challenge here is that the time between when you place an order and the time that you want to receive the order is small, and that limits the opportunities for consolidation. Right? So it limits the opportunities that there's other orders that can, can be combined with your order to drive down these uh, last mile costs. So you can think about that as lead time slack, the time between order placement and the, 
absolute deadline that that order needs to be dispatched from a facility to meet your service commitment, as that grows shorter, that puts a pressure on delivery density. It's harder to create tours or cr to create um, operations that have high levels of density in that case. Um, one last idea before we move into some specifics on some uh, innovations is that you can also drive uh, improved density by improving supply location density. Okay? So in this system, I have a single supply point, let's say a distribution center. And over here, I might have multiple supply points. One of these might be a distribution center, but others may be retail stores. Or maybe these are all retail stores, and I'm filling my e-commerce orders from stores. By, by increasing the density of supply locations, I'm also able to um, improve logistics costs here by improving local density of customer deliveries around those, uh, around those supply points, right? So supply location density also provides flexibility and helps you drive down costs. And of course, uh, if you follow what Amazon has been up to recently by building out a much larger set of distribution centers, their goal, of course, has been to increase their distribution center supply location density for customers. OK, so now let's talk, with the basics in mind, let's talk about some innovations. And some of this is motivated by research that we do here at Georgia Tech. And I want to focus the first part of <clears throat> the research part of this talk on um, same-day delivery. So along with um, my colleague Alejandro Toriello, who I'm not sure is here yet, um, and our PhD student Mateus Klopp, over the last few years, we've looked at a number of challenging problems in dynamic dispatching to support same-day delivery. So in this uh, section of the talk, I'm going to talk about our definition of same-day delivery, which is order today, receive sometime today. Okay? So it's not necessarily a two-hour guarantee like um, Amazon Prime. Um, it's, a, it, it gets, it's a little bit of a longer window, but it's still, the still uh, this feature is still that you're ordering potentially on the same day that you're receiving the goods. And from the logistics side, point, side, the supply side, what it means for the company is that the company may be receiving orders for your to deliver while you're making other deliveries. Okay? So they're still receiving orders, but you've already begun the distribution operation. Okay? So same day delivery is challenging, again, because order size is small, and you still have this idea of many possible geographically dispersed delivery locations, but there's extra things. Short lead time slack here. So now we have a much shorter time to consolidate orders, potentially. Um, and we may use our vehicles multiple times during the operating day. So we may also decide when to dispatch orders during the day. So there's some more complicated decisions about when we might decide to dispatch an order, given that it's ready to go. Um, and what we call that is maybe dynamic updates to dispatching in order to drive cost savings. And I'll try to tr illustrate these ideas and show you some of the things that we've learned in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. OK, so to motivate this a little bit more, suppose over here, suppose I had all these orders for next day delivery. And they happen to all be available and picked at this distribution center. And I built two vehicle up, uh, tours for distributing those goods today. So these, all these orders were placed sometime before uh, today. They were picked and packed and loaded and ready to go. And I could create these nice, two nice tours on the left. If we look at that same set of orders now and just imagine that they were not all placed in advance of operations. Right? So in this case, the green orders might have been placed between 12 and 2 PM. The brown orders between 2 and 4 PM. The blue orders between 4 and 6 PM. And suppose they're all do the deadline for this same day operation is something like 7.30 PM. Okay? So they all need to get done by the end of today. But some of them were placed quite close to the deadline. Right? So if we waited until all the orders were placed, let's say at the latest order came in at 6 PM, I would love to operate these two sequences, but I could never make all these deliveries in time to meet that 7.30 deadline. So I need to do potentially something different. One of the simplest things I could do is just say, well, let's just create three dispatch times, let's say 2 PM, 4 PM, and 6 PM. Whatever orders have arrived by 2 PM, I'll create 
operations to deliver them. Then whatever orders arrive by 4 p.m., I'll create some delivery operations to deliver them, and so on. And then you get tours that look like this. You can see there's a lot of overlapping. Um, and hopefully you can, it's not too difficult to see that the transportation distance of these six uh, tours is much higher than what you saw on the two tours there. Uh, you might need additional vehicles to make this happen, although maybe you can just reuse these same two vehicles three times per day to do this. Okay. So this is sort of the different um, paradigm that we're looking at with same day delivery. So when it comes to decision support, one thing that we wanted to look at in our research was what if we don't consider fixed dispatch time? So what if we don't just say we're going to have a dispatch at 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m.? Let's instead dynamically adjust what we do every day. So there still might be some discrete opportunities for dispatch, but we get to select uh, based on current conditions, based on what we're seeing today in terms of de de demand, what customers have ordered today, where, where products need to be delivered today, we're going to dynamically decide when to dispatch vehicles. And then, of course, at this time, this is a dispatch time here, I can dispatch any order that has, is picked and ready to go before that time. At this time, I can dispatch orders that arrived between the first dispatch and now, but I could also dispatch orders that, that I just decided not to dispatch in the first uh, outbound dispatch. And there might be a good reason why I want to delay some of these to a later dispatch if they don't mesh well geographically with the ones that needed to be dispatched earlier. So that's sort of the system that we're looking at here. Okay, And what you see here is operations for a single vehicle. It waits until it's this first deadline, loaded, dispatched, back to the depot, reloaded, dispatched on a shorter dispatch, and then eventually completes a third dispatch before the end of the operating day. Okay, so if we look at how to make these decisions, there's always trade-offs in terms of cost. And, and the trade-offs in terms of when to dispatch a vehicle, if we think about waiting, if a vehicle waits before dispatching, it allows us to accumulate more orders and then potentially improve that delivery density uh, metric that's so important to help us reduce cost. So waiting allows us to improve delivery density, but it also wastes time because if you wait, then the vehicle is not making productive uh, deliveries in the field. And it's, in some sense, uh, an opportunity cost. So that's the trade-off. And then how about dispatching orders? If I dispatch an order right away, I know I get it done. And I, I get the, um, let's say, the revenue. Or I, don't, I avoid any sort of penalty situation where I don't get an order dispatched uh, in meet service. But if I waited, I could have potentially found later orders that arrive that match up better with that order and create better route sequences, right? So if I, if I delay it, maybe I can find better partners for that order later in the day. So there's these types of trade-offs that we have to balance in these systems. So we looked at this um, from a research perspective. We looked at a single vehicle example. And we've done some analysis using two types of um, two types of paradigms, let's say. In the first, we looked at a very simple system where we imagine here's a distribution center, and all the customers are located on a line outbound from the distribution center. We know this is not realistic, but it's going to help us at least understand these types of systems. Okay, And we can still understand when to dispatch. And in, now it's a little bit of a simpler decision about um, which customers to serve, because what we're going to assume now is that if we dispatch, for example, at this time, W1, all we need to decide is really how far along this line to go. And we're going to assume that we can serve any customer that arrived before then that is closer to the distribution center than the furthest that we go in the, in the sequence. So it sort of simplifies the decision. We don't have to worry about routing and scheduling type uh, sequencing decisions. And our goal is going to be maximizing some reward for serving orders, so maximizing some reward for getting orders done minus the costs uh, related to the dispatch distances here, and the number of dispatches, let's say. So what, you sh what is shown in this picture is actually a plan. Let's say time goes forward left to right, and distance from the distribution center goes up on the board. Uh, the red dots represent when customers show up, and the blue lines represent a dispatching plan. So at this time, I dispatch, but I only serve this one customer, and I come back to the depot by this point. And then I wait until W3, I dispatch, and at that point, sorry, the it's not always um, working the laser, but uh, I can cover all the other red dots that I didn't cover in that blue square 
but the ones uh, outside the blue square are not covered. I get back to the depot at time W4, and then I make a smaller dispatch, and I cover this group in here. All the ones outside the blue are not served. They're sort of missed opportunities. And you can sort of then calculate a uh, reward minus service cost. Now suppose, let's consider the following unrealistic situation now. Suppose um, customer orders do arrive in time, and the red dots represent right along the timeline when they arrive. But suppose that at the time zero here, I know in advance exactly when quarter orders will be ready to be dispatched. So it's, I sort of have a perfect uh, forecast of the future. So I know exactly that this order is going to arrive at this time. It's not going to arrive before that time, so I can't serve it before that time, but I know it's going to arrive for, with certainty at that time. Well, that's, called a deter that's a deterministic problem on the line. And if you look at this type of problem, we can show that optimal solutions always look like this. There's always waiting for a while at the distribution center. And then at some point, vehicles are dispatched. And furthermore, the vehicles are dispatched such that the first dispatch is the longest. The second dispatch is no longer than the first dispatch. And so they're non-increasing um, over time. So this is the longer one, and then there's a shorter one. And you can show that an optimal solution always has this form. And furthermore, because in this simple line setting, we can show that it's not difficult to have an algorithm to find the best possible way of trading off this reward maximization and uh, cost uh, minimization in this setting. There's an efficient algorithm for finding an optimal solution here. What's interesting is, because of course in the real world problem, the arrival times are not known, right? You don't know. Uh, at this time, all you know is you have these two orders that are ready to go. You don't know when these other orders are going to arrive necessarily. So suppose these future order arrival uh, times, or I use the word arrival time, but it's really the time that the order is picked and ready to be dispatched. Um, suppose they're modeled as some random variables. In this case, we might want to come up with a system that optimizes the expected reward minus cost that we would earn in this, in this system. And this is a very difficult problem. This is among the hardest class of computer science problems in the MP-hard class. You can formulate it as a dynamic program and solve it recursively, but you can't get very far when the problems get of reasonable size. There's another approach called a priori optimization that we take advantage of in this research, which is the following. Suppose I, I'm going to develop a fixed plan. So I'm going to decide that I'm going to dispatch at this time, and I'm going to go this far, and I'm going to decide at the, uh, this time and go this far in advance. I'm going to fix that in advance, and I'm going to select it such that it minimizes expected cost. Uh, you might have some very simple updating rules like never go beyond why travel further than the furthest order you need to deliver, that kind of thing. But other than that, it's basically a fixed plan. Um, and is this problem any easier? And it turns out, yes. It turns out this problem, maximizing this expected revenue minus cost, is no more difficult than the deterministic problem. And I sort of describe how that works here. You just replace uncertain customer orders with multiple copies, representing each possible time the customer order might show up with a probability. And then it's, you can use the similar algorithm or the same algorithm to optimize that problem. So it's actually not difficult to solve optimal a priori plans that build these plans in advance uh, that minimize or maximize the expected revenue minus cost. Not only does this hold for the simplified geometry, but we also show in our research that this holds when customers are not just located on a line. So you can show that as well. OK, um, last thing, and then I'll show you some results uh, here. <coughs> Of course, developing one fixed plan at time zero here is, a, is also not necessarily ideal. I mean, what if things are quite different today than you expected? What if there's an opportunity today to take advantage of changes that happen in reality, adapt to them, and change our plan? So what we actually are proposing is that we're going to use develop dynamic plans for these systems where I'm going to continuously think about uh, changing my plan in real time in response to conditions. And one very effective approach is actually using that a priori optimization strategy in what we call a rollout scheme. 
So in the rollout scheme, it's very easy. Think about this. At any time the vehicle is at the distribution center, remember this is a single vehicle problem, I'm just going to compute a new optimal a priori solution from now until the end of the horizon. And again, I told you that that isn't too difficult to do. So you have a new set of known orders that might change things because you know, at 2 p.m. things might look different to you than they did at 8 a.m. Okay? So use that new information and compute a new plan. And then you just dispatch the vehicle on the first route that's proposed by that a priori plan. Do what it's said to do. You're back at the distribution center, and then you repeat. That's called a rollout of this simple strategy. And we find that this approach works very well. So using this idea of a priori optimization in this repeated rollout uh, setting. So here's some results, for example, for problems on the line. What you see here, the gray line represents just looking at the a priori solution. And the axis here from 0 to 18, this is the percent uh, gap between the solutions that we find by our dynamic policies and the best one could ever do. And the way we estimate the best one could ever do is we imagine that you had perfect information. So we use the perfect information case to decide what's the best we could ever do. So these are gaps with an unrealistic lower bound. And it actually shows pretty well that a priori solutions are not so good with small numbers of orders. Uh, but when you get large number of orders, a priori solutions work almost the same as dynamic solutions. And then the gap between the gray and the red line here, <coughs> or the blue line, either one, they're sort of minor technical variations that we don't need to worry about. Uh, it represents the savings that you can get by finding a dynamic plan. Right? So for example, for about 10 customers, I can reduce the penalty from 17% over optimal down to like 7%. So I've dramatically improved um, operations by rolling out the a priori plan rather than just computing it once in advance. So to finish up this part of the talk, I do want to talk a little bit about more realistic geographies, right? Because we all know that customers are not located on the line. And to be honest, I mean, one problem with problems on the line is that there's a lot, it's probably the maximum amount of benefit for uh, pooling of customers in that case. Because we assume that if you travel you know, this far, that you can serve all the customers that are closer with no marginal cost. And that's a little bit of a strong assumption. <clears throat> so we wanted to look at more realistic geographies. Uh, in these types of settings, there may be travel costs that are defined by a network, or they're defined by like a metric on the uh, on like an L2 metric, for example. You can also incorporate times where the vehicle has to stop at a delivery here, which also increases realism. So we've looked at this more realistic case. <clears throat> and in this case, notice that I still might need to decide when to dispatch a vehicle, like at time three here and again at time two. I apologize that all the times are always counting down to time zero. It's something that Mateus liked, and I, I always had trouble remembering. But the higher time is earlier in the day. Okay. So you still need to decide when the vehicles are going to be dispatched. But now, when the vehicle is dispatched, you need to decide which subset of orders to serve and in which sequence to serve them. Okay? So if you look at the plan here, for example, at time three, I dispatched this red route. And I've decided to serve this customer, this customer, this customer, and this customer. The labels in the, the nodes represent the time that the order was picked and ready to go. So notice that for the route that was dispatched at time three, all of these numbers are greater than or equal to three, which means they were all ready. Some were greater time, were available at time six, some at time four, and time three. Remember, time is counting down just to confuse you. Uh, once you get to time two, you dispatch the blue route. And notice that you can now see some twos in there, right? Um, but by the time I complete the blue route, I have no more time left. So the ones that showed up at time one, I just can't serve in this case. So the, I don't get the reward for serving them. This problem is much more difficult than the problem of dispatching on the line because it also combines, for the students who are here, I mean, you might recognize that there's some traveling salesperson type problem going on in here as well as everything else I've been talking about. So the deterministic dispatching problem is more complex. But if I did, again, know the orders and the arrival times of the orders in advance, there is something I can do. Uh, we formulated this as a modified variant of an extension of that traveling salesperson problem called the prize collecting traveling salesperson problem. That's a fairly well-known problem. And we, we changed that again to another uh, extension where uh, it has order release times. In other words, the orders are only available to be dispatched at specific times during the day. And you can use multiple 
dispatches from this distribution center, but they can't overlap in time because this is going to be one vehicle solutions. Okay. Uh, we have a formulation that solves this problem fairly effectively using integer programming methods, and I'm not going to go into the details, but it, it uses some advanced integer programming methods, doing some customization on the branch and bound and uh, heuristics. Um, again, we're going to use the same paradigm to solve these problems. We can show that this same prize collecting, modified prize collecting TSP, which we can solve for the deterministic problem, we can again solve a priori problems with that, right? So you go from deterministic to a priori. Um, and then we're going to roll them out uh, again. Now, the difficulty here is that it does take more time to compute solutions here. So one thing, one modification that we've done is that we don't resolve the a priori problem until the time that the a priori solution decides the first vehicle dispatch. But in general, it's roughly the same. And I just wanted to show you, as, we, as I finish up here, how this, again, this rollout policy performs. Again, it performs much better than the a priori strategy. So here the gap of the a priori strategy is 23%, again, to that best possible case. And we basically cut the gap in half, right? So you get a 50% reduction in the penalty due to uncertainty. And uh, these, we believe these solutions are pretty good. It's hard to say that this, how far this is from the optimal solution, but we believe that it's much closer than 12%, probably more like within the 5% range. You can also see that uh, the, the policies on the right here, and sorry, the laser isn't working, FR is the fill rate. Ooh. Come on. This is the fill rate here. So more orders are getting um, fulfilled when we use the rollout policy versus the operator policy. And notice that the next line, the duration per order, that's sort of the cost per delivery. Okay? And notice that that's not increasing very much, but we're driving up the fill rate. So we're basically making better uh, vehicle utilization decisions with our rollout strategy. There's another strategy that's somewhere in between. It's a little bit simpler than the full rollout. I'm not going to talk about it. It, all, it works about half as well. It's basically half way between. Last point I want to make, is one thing that we found out in this study, is that if your goal is to deliver, make as many deliveries as possible, uh, it carries a stiff cost. So maximizing fill rate is something we do here by increasing this parameter alpha. As alpha gets bigger, the objective focuses mainly on just getting as much reward possible and ignoring the transportation costs. And you can see that if I want to drive fill rate from somewhere between about 85% to 91%, I had to almost incur or incur more than a 50% increase in my travel cost per order. And that's a fairly interesting result. So a uh, 6% uh, increase in fill rate requires a 50% increase in cost per order. We found that interesting. Um, and here's looking at two different plans. The plan on the left is the balanced plan that is sort of balancing fill rate with transportation cost. The one on the right is trying to drive as much fill rate as possible. And you can see they're only different. They only serve, the, one, the plan on the right only serves one additional customer, but it costs a lot more to do so. So one, as we've looked at furthering this research or going to the next step, we're looking at problems about deciding which customers to offer same-day delivery service to or not. We call, and that's probably the most important bullet point here. We're also looking at multiple vehicle problems and problems of adding capacity dynamically, like surge type capacity. But I really want to focus on the first one. You know, in an online ordering environment, when a customer is browsing, you can decide what types of delivery options to show them. So if you're just, if you, it, you can respond dynamically to conditions on the ground and say, right now, based on what types of capacity I have left to make same-day delivery orders today, maybe it's wise if I don't even show them the same-day delivery option, right? It's better not to offer that, right? So that's what we've looked at in these accept-reject problems using similar frameworks. Anyway, so that's a summary of some of the research that we've done here in same-day dispatching. It's been fun to work on. And later on, I'd be happy to talk to you about um, possible ideas that you might have along those lines. Um, Right. More orders than expected. I'll turn it over now to Mark. All right. I will get started since I have more slides and less time. Uh, so we'll do some online scheduling to see how we deal with that. 
Um, so I'm not going to go into much detail on any of the research that is related to the topics that I'm going to discuss. Uh, my goal here is primarily to introduce some of the ideas that we've been working on and how they relate to uh, the topic of last mile logistics. So, and I may go into one slightly deeper. So, of course, companies have realized, I mean, the slide that Ellen showed about Amazon that shows that as a percentage of revenue, the amount that they're paying for shipment is going up is the part that worries them, right? So in a way, they yes, they increase their revenues, which is great, but as a percentage, they're spending more money to actually make the deliveries, and that's the part that concerns them. And so, and that's not only true for Amazon, that's of course true for any company. So all of them are looking at cost reduction strategies in this business to consumer space. Right? And we're going to look at the few of them uh, that I listed here. And um, the two main ideas here are that delivery density is important, but we've argued that last mile delivery is challenging because we have all these changing delivery locations that can be anywhere as opposed to simply delivering to stores that don't move, are always there and want big loads, right? So one of the ideas is can we somehow change where we actually make the delivery, right? So that's the first one. And the second one is can we sort of re-engineer our business processes or start thinking about how we might deliver differently, right? And so the ones that we're going to look at is um, box delivery, um, trunk delivery, drones, and crowd shipping, right? And there are others, but these are the ones that we're going to look at, right? So one of the ideas is that maybe rather than going to a consumer's home, if we have a parcel box that they pass on their way to work, on their way to sports, on their way to church, uh, at the subway station, right? We can use that to make deliveries to individuals, right? And note that here, of course, um, you make deliveries to many people in the same location, which from a lo logistics perspective is much better. Plus, if you manage to place them closer to your fulfillment center, you save as well. Right? So this is the first idea. Uh, many companies are looking at these. Um, so why are we interested in it? Quantity variation is reduced, right? I mean, I'm always putting deliveries in the, the box. Uh, the box is always in the same location, so I can sort of anticipate that. And if I locate them strategically, they will be closer to my supply point. So lots of advantages. Um, of course, why is it interesting to us? Because it leads to a set of new questions that we haven't addressed before, right? How many of these boxes should you have? Where should you locate them? What should the design be? And how do you actually route uh, packages to that? And I'm not going to touch upon this very much, but obviously in the dynamic setting that Ellen spent a lot of time on, this gets even more interesting, right? You swipe your credit card, you pick up your package out of the box. Now that box is available for somebody else, but if so, you need to resupply, right? So the dynamic settings here are always more challenging and in a way more interesting. The other idea is to, rather than introducing parcel boxes, what if we deliver to somebody's car, right? Auto manufacturers now all uh, start including technology that can allow you to give access to the trunk of your car uh, controlled a one-time access, right? So companies like Amazon and others are quite intrigued by this option for, for two reasons, right? One, if 10% of us had ordered something on Amazon yesterday and we would have all come by car, they could make the delivery right here on campus 
as opposed to going to uh, all of our homes, which is probably cheaper. The other thing, and this is more important in Europe and Asia, is if you make a delivery, somebody has to sign for it. And so missed deliveries is a major problem in the business to consumer space. And if the legislation is there that if you go to somebody, the trunk of somebody's car, it's considered as an accepted delivery because you gave them the access code, then that problem may go away. Right? So this is certainly somewhat something that people are looking at. Again, what are we uh, saving here? Uh, location flexibility, right? Because we don't have to go to somebody's home necessarily. We might decide to go to a location that is more convenient to us, closer to the fulfillment center, for example. Uh, so here is the idea, if you think a bit more about sort of the research questions. So uh, the brown dots are home locations, the blue dots are locations where the car is going to be during the day, let's say at work, at soccer practice, at the grocery store, and I have a depot or fulfillment center. So rather than having to go to the homes, I could decide to deliver like this. Right? So some I deliver at the home location, other I deliver closer. And this would be if I only had home locations as an option. Right? So you see that the blue looks a bit shorter than the brown one. That's the idea. Um, what are the challenges? Well, clearly if you think about this, I would have to know where the car is going to be during the day. Right? And the other thing, and uh, that may not be such a challenge in the future. A lot of companies are betting on knowing your travel behavior. And if I go to work every day, probably they know my car is going to be in the parking lot here. So, but that's certainly a challenge. Um, and then there is some uncertainty, right? Sometimes I go home at 6, sometimes I go home at 4, right? You have to be able to deal with that. And the routing problem gets more complex, which of course is interesting for me. Um, the other option is drones. Um, we've all seen some of these pictures, videos, and that is still something that is unclear exactly where things are going to go, but it's an interesting opportunity. And again there, what are we trying to do? It is one, eliminating the driver expense that you have. You don't have a person on a truck making a delivery. Uh, and what they promote primarily is faster delivery time, right? You can get something in half an hour instead of an hour or two hours. Um, again, there are lots of interesting questions. If you decide that this is something that you want to pursue, how many should you have, which order should you assign to drones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing that is interesting, and this is just one particular example that at least intrigued me, is that of crowd shipping, right? And here the idea is something that was uh, proposed by Walmart, is what if customers that come to my store are willing to make a delivery of an order that was placed online, right? How could I exploit that, right? So again, the motivation is it could be cheaper because I may not have to reward them as much as my own drivers, uh, but obviously there are also challenges, right? So the idea here in terms of pictorially what you can do is Brown dots represent locations where I have to make a delivery. Blue dots represent locations where somebody that's currently in my store is going and that have indicated that they're willing to make a delivery for me. Then I could have a combination, right? I could have a, uh, some orders still done by company vehicles, but some done by the in-store customers. And this is the idea of crowd shipping. Right, so very interesting questions uh, there, especially in this particular setting, there are interesting questions about compensation, right? How much should I reward an in-store customer? What flexibility does the in-store customer have? And obviously the two are probably related, right? And we hear a lot about Uber Freight. They're all in this same realm 
of research questions that we're studying. Um, reduced fleet, right? Fewer company vehicles, fewer company drivers is what's driving the decision. Right, or part of the decision making. But of course there is uncertainty in terms of these flexible drivers, whether they will be available or not. How do you balance that? Um, fleet sizing, number of drivers, which should be fulfilled by in-store customers, a whole range of interesting questions that we're researching. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time think, uh, talking about uh, what I label here as the holy grail of last mile logistics in the sense that the service requirements here are probably uh, the tightest from anything that you can think of, right? So we've been working together with Grubhub, who also operates here in Atlanta, where you can go on their app, say I want sushi, uh, they show you a bunch of restaurants, you pick your favorite one, and they make sure it will be delivered at the location that you want, right? And of course, since it's food, we don't want to, to place the order at 6 and then have to wait until 9.30. Typically, we would like to see it arrive within, let's say, 45 minutes, right? So there is an awful lot of pressure, time pressure, to make this happen. Right. Um, what's interesting to us, and this is a statistic that was probably, uh, I don't know, a few, two months old, maybe three months old, right? The scale of this problem gets larger and larger, right? They're currently making, at least in this particular instant, when I looked at their website, uh, 250,000 deliveries per day. Now, of course, they're not all in the same city. Uh, but the scale is another interesting question for us from a research perspective. How do you develop technology that can, in a few seconds, deal with that many orders and still be cost effective? Um, so I, I am going to talk a little bit about the challenges that you face and some of the issues that come up, right? So um, they're high service expectations. Right? And also from the company, this is, so first of all, it's important to realize that they make most of their money from the restaurants, not from the consumers or the diners. Right? The restaurants have a contract with them and say, we'd like to reach a larger market. If you can do the delivery for us, we can. Right? So, um, but both of them are interested in what they call click to door, which is I push the button, I want my meal. Uh, when does it actually arrive at my home? And of course, ready to door freshness is important. It's ready at the restaurant. When does it reach my home? Um, it's highly dynamic, right? This is what makes it interesting to us, right? Uh, order placements can come at any time from any location, from any restaurants that we have in our portfolio, right? Uh, and these things differ by day of week, by hour of the day, by weather conditions, etc. Right? So it's, it's a fantastic place to experiment with last mile logistics technology. Um, so what are the challenges, right? How many drivers should I have on a particular day, right? Is there a Braves game? Does that change anything? Right. Um, how long should the shifts be? Should I employ drives? And by the way, these are never company employees. Right. These are more the Uber type drivers that say, I have a few hours available. I'm willing to make deliveries for you. Right. So should we do that in chunks of two hours or four hours of three hours? What is the best strategy? When should they start? Um, should we actually deliver multiple orders in a single trip? right, by a single driver. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, if we do multiple orders in a single trip, should they come from one restaurant or from multiple restaurants? So typically, if you think about the problem that we're facing, right, we have orders that specify a restaurant. We know when the click happens, right, that's the placement time. As soon as the click happens, there is something in the back that says it's at this restaurant. That restaurant typically at this time of day takes 15 minutes to prepare. So we have a planned ready time for the order. Uh, we have drivers and uh, we have different objectives. That's also uh, an important aspect. 
So here uh, again is the performance metrics, loss of surface that is related to click of door. We, would, we have a target, right? Wrap up has a target that says about 45 minutes. Uh, if we have a click to door of an hour, we are not making sort of our target. And similarly with freshness. And there are lots of questions about that. Um, driver utilization, of course, is important. If we have low utilization, the only way to serve all the orders is to have more drivers. Uh, and drivers are only happy if they have a high utilization because that's their compensation scheme. They, are, they tend to be, I mean, in a simplistic view, uh, paid just per order that they deliver. Now they're sort of incentive schemes and bonuses, et cetera, but that's the basis. So they too want to have uh, a high utilization. The underlying optimization methodology that we use is a matching problem or an assignment problem where you can think of drivers on one side, orders on the other side. We look at the combination. We somehow have an evaluation about the attractiveness of having a particular driver do a particular order, and then we solve. And this is a standard optimization problem that we can solve in seconds, even for large problems. And of course, um, Alan talked about this rollout strategy. We do make these decisions every minute, every two minutes, right? So the information is constantly updated and our decisions reflect the latest state of the system. What are some of the challenges? Fairness, right? So um, we like probably to be fair to each of the diners. Even though one may be in a very busy area, the other may be in a less busy area, uh, we cannot simply say we only serve the people in the busy area because it's cheaper to us, right? So how do we balance that? Um, Utilization and diner experience, right? If we put five orders in a single trip, we probably make better use of the driver, but automatically four of the five orders are not going to be as early as they could be, right? So how do you make that trade-off? Uh, order information is revealed over time. Uh, the other thing that is very big is the system intensity, saying the number of orders that are in the system, of course, varies over time, right? There is kind of a bump at lunchtime, and then there is a big pump, bump at dinner time. How do you dynamically adjust to that? And if it rains, suddenly the bump is even bigger, right? So system intensity is a big issue. Um, I think I'm going to skip some of the details here. Um, as I mentioned, system state is important. What uh, characterizes the system? The number of currently unassigned orders, right, that have just come in, for example, or I haven't assigned yet. The drivers and the intensity because our decision uh, ideas or technology depends very much on the system state. For example, in very busy periods, we have no choice but to put more orders in a single trip, just because we need to utilize the drivers better. And we sacrifice a little bit in sort of the, the, the freshness, uh, for example. Uh, so bundling of orders is important. If the system is very busy, there is no way we can serve all the orders if we don't bundle orders. So then there are questions about how do you do that? What's the effective way to do it? Uh, should you have single restaurant order bundles or multi-restaurant order bundles? Um, we generate them in a certain way. In a way, they're very small vehicle routing problems. Uh, we also concatenate some bundles into a bigger bundle, just some ideas that I wanted to share with you. Um, we also distinguish between the orders in the system, right? Orders that have been longer in the system, that's the way to think about this, become more and more important, right? Uh, we may not be able at any time to treat every order the same way. Some will have to remain in the system a little bit longer. We want to recognize that they've been in the system, right? So we actually think about this driver to order assignment in sort of a staged uh, organization. Um, 
There are also some issues about commitments. We always make a complete plan. At every point that we run an optimization, we make a complete plan. We don't necessarily have to immediately start the execution of that plan. Right? And that depends a little bit on these situations. Right? Sometimes, because we optimize every two minutes, if my current decision doesn't really affect anything in the next two minutes, I might as well say, OK, it looks good now. I'll revisit in two minutes when I optimize again. So that has to do with commitment strategies. All right, a few practical complications. Um, communication with drivers might be lost. Right? This happens in practice. Uh, they may be out of the car making a delivery and are not looking at their little screen. If I have a task for them, they have to say yes or no. Uh, if they're not answering within a minute, what do I do? Right? Do I assign it to a different driver? Do I wait? Uh, that's a practical issue. Drivers, since they're not company employees, do what they think is best for them not what is good for the company. And of course, you have to try with sort of the compensation scheme and incentives to align these as best as you can, but there are some major issues, right? Intuitively, a driver believes that he's, if he's making deliveries in Midtown, that may be better than somewhere out in the suburbs where the density is much smaller, right? Whether that's true or not is a different question. But it means that drivers tend to sort of move into the same area, which actually is very bad for the drivers themselves, but certainly bad from a delivery perspective because I may not have uh, drivers where I need them, right? And that's a big problem. And then there is bunches of uncertainty that we have to deal with. All right, so this is a phenomenally interesting problem where we get lots of new research questions that we're investigating, and they take some of the ideas that we generate and put them in their production systems. Uh, I did want to switch topics a little bit and talk about something that I also find interesting, which is a little bit of a different flavor, right? In all the ones that I talked about up to now, really, in essence, the research that we do is creating better routing and scheduling decisions, right? That's the focus. Whether it's vehicle routing algorithms, dispatching technology, matchings, the focus is on improving the decisions that we make. Um, here, the idea is the complete opposite. And so, first of all, um, this is probably very well known. More and more people are gonna live in urban areas, closer together. Uh, more, and people, more and more people will order online. Maybe we should rethink how we do this business to consumer delivery. Uh, and so I want to think about innovative delivery strategies or at least practical delivery strategies that work. And this work was motivated by um, Amazon China. Uh, and how they organize deliveries in, for example, Beijing, right? So, of course, as a researcher, you say, okay, I have a, an area, I have a distribution center, I have satellite or intermediate distribution facilities. This is a phenomenal, fantastic, interesting routing problem. Right? A two echelon vehicle routing problem. And there is a bunch of research on how to solve these. Um, what happens in practice is something completely different, right? They don't run routing algorithms. They say, okay, I have a distribution center, a city distribution center that's on the outside of the region. I divide my sort of Beijing up into 13 or 14 regions. I have a satellite in each of these regions. Within a region, I divide everything up in cells, and the idea is I give a cell to a driver and let the driver go off and figure out himself what to do, right? No fancy routing, but in a way, a bit of a design, right? How do you design the regions? How do you do the cells? And cells are usually relatively easy because boundaries have to be roads, uh, etc. Right? And so we wanted to know if that's actually a reasonable strategy or not. Right? And uh, 
I put it there, our intuition is that if you have a very high density, this actually is quite good. You don't need fancy routing software to do it, right? But we wanted to see if that's really true, right? And in the process, we came up with some interesting things. So um, maybe the most important thing to mention is what it says there, that so at the moment, Amazon's thinking is region and then cell and one driver per cell, right? We found that you can do much better by adding one bit of intelligence, and that is actually combining a few cells and calling, we call that the block, and then assigning two or three drivers to the block, and still, on each individual day, I look at the orders in the block. I do something very simple. If I have two drivers per block, I give half of them to one and half of them to the other. But it helps you deal with the variability that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. It's also extremely important when you start thinking about growing a market, right? If you don't know the exact densities that are going to be in each cell. And so um, we developed, uh, well, we did a bunch of tests on a, sort of a part of Beijing uh, where we have four regions. Uh, 87 cells, the region is listed over there. Um, the other something interesting that comes up, as I mentioned, the block concept seemed to be, turned out to be very important. So then there is a new optimization problem that comes into play. That is how you are going to create the blocks, right? And that leads to relatively simple optimization problems. So what we do here is we have a target number of orders or a target density for a block, something that we can handle with either two or three drivers. And now we, of course, we also want the cells that we put in a block to be somehow contiguous, right? I mean, you don't want to assign a driver to cells that are in, in different parts of the city. They need to be contiguous. And so you can see at the bottom that based on how you do this optimization, they may start to look a, a little bit different in shape. Right? Some are, the center here is where the satellite is, where the products come from. And you can see that shape will have some impact on the driver picks up, can immediately start delivering, or first he drives a little bit, and which one is more important. So there were a number of interesting aspects to this problem. Um, the remainder of the slides are mostly results, so I'm going to skip these. Um, the one that, is, so the one maybe that I will point out is the one on the left. If you do things purely by cells, uh, it doesn't necessarily work that well in every conditions. As soon as you add blocks, which is a very simple, simple idea, bang, you can do almost as good as using sophisticated vehicle routing algorithms for almost all densities, which is interesting. Um, so. Because we're already a bit on the late side, I want to end by saying that uh, last my logistics research uh, is a lot of fun, is very important, and it's all about effective and sustainable delivery today and tomorrow, right? And as I said, one thing is better decision technology, but the other is really rethinking about what strategies are going to work, right? And we try to do both. All right, I think Ellen and I have given you at least an overview of the kind of questions that we've been working on. Um, we feel that there is still an awful lot to do in this area, um, and we will continue to do so. Uh, and we are happy to um, answer a few questions if there are questions. And of course, if there are no questions, then we hope you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, in terms of what are predictive uh, patterns for a restaurant, for example, right? Because uh, orders always are linked to restaurants. And so if we know that certain restaurants are likely to be busy 10 minutes from now, we may already steer our decisions towards making sure that drivers will be in that location. Um, 
So all of these are indeed, I mean, good questions to ask. And anticipation is a big part of the research questions that we're studying and that we're trying to help them. Um, what is it about combining a few cells into a block that makes it perform so much better? Is it just aggregating some of the variability? Well, the, the, so the simplest way to think about it is if you are very restrictive about the cell, and that cell uh, today, and so drivers can typically deliver 50 orders. They go on an electric bicycle and they make, let's say, 50 orders, deliver 50 orders. If you're very restrictive and say, here is a cell, that's your cell, that's what you do every day, some days there will be 30 orders in that cell, some days there will be 40, some days there will even be 55. Uh, that's not necessarily the case with the neighboring cell, that might just be a little different. So uh, you, you in a way reduce variability by being less restrictive. Yeah, so, uh, and it's also the case, especially in a growing market, right? you say they can do 50, at the moment that block or that, well, that cell only has 25, but tomorrow it may have this, you, you're able to hinder variability there. I just want to make one more comment about this type of risk pool. I mean, it's basically the, you know, the IE risk pool concept. There's been a lot of research in a lot of different areas, some of it's transportation logistics, some of it's uh, production flexibility that shows that just a little bit of flexibility, like assigning a, a region to two drivers or three drivers, provides almost as much benefit as if you share all your resources entirely over an entire system and had to re-optimize, which I think is the point you were trying to make. So I, even some research that I did 20 years ago, I, sh I saw something very similar in uh, a stochastic vehicle routing where you just had two vehicles sort of pairing up to work together. So there are also some hidden benefits, if, if you will. Um, so you have a driver who's specializing in one yep. cell, or in our case, it would be um, one loop or one mount, if you will. They're specializing in that. Their driver area knowledge of how to get from point A to B to C and what, you know, which parking lots to cut through and you know, how to do that most efficiently. I mean, so you want to keep you do that job team. for several like years. Team. I mean, they are experts on those areas. Yeah. When they go on vacation, <laughs> right, or they're out sick, or something happens, and they can't do that route. Now you have a driver. You're throwing them out there, and they have no area knowledge. So, if you if you design your routes so that there is some overlap or flexibility over time, you have this kind of team of drivers who kind of know the area among different. They can cover for one another, and so that doesn't really show up in the algorithms, but in the real world, it can be a lifesaver to get things to live. Yes. You guys talk a lot about uh, the dynamic pricing, so efficiency, or I'm sorry, dynamic dispatching, so efficiency, you talk about, you know, driving cost savings. Uh, what about the other side, the revenue stream, right? Um, what studies have been done around maximizing revenue, you know, along with the efficiency and customer satisfaction? Because think about it, Amazon's losing billions of dollars a year because they're meeting customer expectations. You know, are there any studies out there that you guys are so, so it's, it, it's interesting, so um, I was at Amazon a few months ago uh, at one of their summits and this was uh, a question that came up, uh, especially from academics, uh, because revenue management, dynamic pricing are things that we have been thinking about for many, many years. And, uh, airlines, of course, are a prime example. Uh, I mean, it was an interesting re response in the way their philosophy, uh, certainly up to now, they may be changing it to me, is growing market share. If that's costing us money, it means market size is going to sort of uh, be enough return on investment. Um, and for example, the whole idea of Amazon Prime, right, two days, if you remember, it's going to be two days. Um, you, you worry or wonder, right? I order things that, okay, I get them in a few days. It wouldn't have made any difference if it would have been four days or even five days, etc. Uh, now it's hard for them to go back 
on that because I'm used to it. Um, but yes, there is certainly thinking about how do you price uh, for, I mean, how do you sort of try to balance the cost with the revenues that you get? And so it's certainly not something that is completely ignored. I mean, sometimes business at the, where you are uh, in the time of your expansion or life, you make, uh, you focus on cost. At some point, you have to get also back to the revenue side. It's unavoidable. Is there an incentive in inducing higher demands in certain time windows in the same way delivery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, and that sort of comes back to pricing, for example. Or, so in all of these problems, there, there are these demand management issues. So or can you drive up demand in times that can take uh, advantage of times when you may have excess capacity? So, um, there's a lot of work to be done in these types of problems, especially Especially integrating it with the, um, with the logistics cost side, I think there's less research that does a good job of looking at the two things together. Because that's what, I mean, I'm a bean counter attorney, right? So to me, that's what efficiencies that you also want to have some pockets. Sure. Yeah. There's a balance there. Yeah, we, we, we know that the today's talk was focused primarily on, for given service, what can you do? No, I just so interested to see what, you know, what is happening in the region. I have to, uh, Go because I have another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to. <laughs> <laughs>